Hello and welcome to JTimes, where we uncover the Kabbalah take on Jewish issues and current events. With me, as always, is Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lightman. Hello, Dr. Lightman. Hello. Today is a special show. Um, it's Purim, and we all know it's a very special holiday. Um, so, because it's a special holiday, we're going to take a special take on Purim, and we're not going to focus on the usual things like what are the hamantashim, the, the Haman's ears are for, and uh, all of those very nice things that belong to Purim. But I want to take advantage of the fact that we have Kabbalist Dr. Michael Eitman with us and, um, and really take another angle, take another look at the deeper meaning of this holiday because it holds within it a very special meaning and especially important now in these days with everything that's happening around us. We see um, basically the moral collapse of, of our society. And I think Purim has a very important message to tell us in that respect. Uh, before I, I ask uh, Dr. Michael Eitman uh, uh, the questions, I want to read something to you. There's a book called Shamati, I Heard. It was written by uh, a great Kabbalist. Uh, his name was uh, Rabbi Yehuda Ashlag. He was known as Bala Sulam. He wrote the Sulam commentary on the Book of Zohar. And, and Shamati holds within it very special, um, not, I wouldn't say essays, but kind of speeches and things he said during meals, during special occasions, that his son, the Kabbalist, uh, Rabbi Bauch Ashlag, who was also uh, Dr. Lightman's teacher, he wrote them down, and it turned out to be very special pieces of text. They're very powerful, and some of the addresses here in this book relate to the holiday of Purim. Some of them are very long. I'm going to take a very short one, a very special one, um, because it really holds within, holds within it the, the, the gist of the holiday and the point that I want to make here. And I want to read to you from here. It's... Um, Article number 144 in this book, Shamati. Um, it's called, There is a Certain People. There's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples. Haman said that in his view, we will succeed, we as in, and, as in Haman's allies, in destroying the Jews because they are separated from one another. Therefore, our force against them will certainly prevail as it causes separation between man and God, between them and the Creator, in other words. And the Creator will not help them, the Jews, because they are separated. So Mordechai, Barazam explains, went to correct that flaw, and he assembled the Jews. Yes, uh, as it says, the Jews gathered. This means that they saved themselves by uniting. That's the end of, of the article, really. Now, I want to ask you, Dr. Michael Lightman, what is it that really is so important about unity that saved the Jews from death? That's how it is with each and every generation. When we came out of Babylon 4,000 years ago as uh, the group of Abraham that united according to the rule of love another as thyself, something that the Babylonians could not agree to. And only a small group that connected to Abraham, they came out with them and they called themselves the people of Israel from the word Yeshar Kel, straight to the Creator where they're completely in chassadim, meaning mercy and about unity, and this is how they went and grew until they called themselves a nation. But actually, it is a group that agreed on being united as one man and one heart in brotherly love, and that's how we existed. And in times where we did not keep the unity, then we used to fall. We came out of Egypt through unity. With the help of unity, we went through the desert, conquered the land of Israel, built the temple, and then we fell. Then we fell from the unity, from the good connection between us of love and chassadim, mercy, a sense of mercy between us. We fell a bit into the ego. And then, the moment we're no longer united, we're being thrown out of the land of Israel, and this is where we were thrown back to Babylon. 
And this is exactly what happened. The Purim happened before the first and the second temple. In the Babylonian exile. Yes, the Babylonian exile. Today is Iran, Iraq. And then uh, this is what happened, meaning that how to stop the exile, how to return the Jews to the land of Israel. So what happened there was something done by Amman, where wicked Amman, he started uh, talking about the eradication of the Jews. And what did Mordechai do against that? He started uniting them. He started crying out and convincing them that if we'll unite, we'll succeed, we'll win. If not, that not only in their capital of, uh, of this kingship, this Babylonian kingship, kingship uh, the capital Shushan, but in all the 127 countries, we will be destroyed and eradicated, all of us, including those that remained, the few that remained in the land of Israel. And then the Jews, they united. That's called that they started fighting Amman. That, that's our war, that if we unite, we drive away immediately all enemies. And that ended this war, actually, which is a spiritual war. And the Jews, they returned from Babylon to the land of Israel, meaning that we see here that actually Amman, he played a positive role. The Jews themselves, they didn't want to unite. Which is why they went to exile in the first place. Yes. Yes, of course. And they neither had the strength to unite. There has to be some kind of a stimulation, some kind of a reason to start to unite. They were kind of loose in exile under the rule of the nations of the world, under this whole foreign environment. And so they behaved like the nations of the world and even worse. And they also succeeded in foreign cultures like we're used to in every country that we enter, we immediately succeed there to find our place there. And this is what Amman as if made help made against, that he forced us to unite, and we united and came back to the land of Israel and built the second temple. And during the second temple, the same thing happened. We were united on a on a high level, as one man and one heart, as one nation, and again the ego started growing. And at the times of Rabbi Akiva, where he cried out that love, we have to keep that love another as thyself, and no one really listened, and somehow instead of love, they reached unfounded hatred. And we fell into unfounded hatred and were exiled again. And again, I, I want to ask about the war you were talking about. Because it's it's a very obviously a spiritual war in the sense that here you have an enemy, you have someone who is going out to destroy you, and you, instead of fighting back, what you're doing is you're staying among yourselves and you unite among you instead of fighting back. That's a totally different approach than what we see what we normally see when someone comes at you. That's exactly the correct attitude, because if we unite, then there is no force in the world that can go against us. No force in the world. And this happened throughout the entire history. And we're also writing a book about history where it will speak about all those cases. And it's really a wonder how it happens exactly so. And also the same in our times. We're once again dispersed all over the world, the exile is coming to an end according to the plan of creation, according to what's happening in nature. We have to return to the land of Israel once again. And so anti-Semitism will start to increase around the world. It is already. It's happening all over the world. We can see it. It's still not so that each and every Jew, wherever he is, feels that it really reaches, uh, that it really touches him. But he thinks that still he can hide somehow and go someplace and 
Still, we don't understand that here we're facing the, the force of nature that must return us to the right place, not physically. We can we can uh, stay Americans and uh, French and uh, German and wherever, but we have to be united between us and we have to be united between us around those that are in the land of Israel. And only then, only then will we win against all of our enemies. So what you're saying is our only weapon and and really the only weapon that can work is not to fight against the enemy, but for unity among us. We see that as powerful as we are and as successful as we are in wars here in Israel, we don't win. It is impossible to win. It'll always be, things will be always so dangerous and uh, uh, we'll feel fear and uh, uncertainty and lack of security until we understand that we can win only by the power of unity. We have weapons and we have an army and we're ready, but nonetheless you can't win. You, you can't win in this state, in this situation. Everything is arranged so that you need here some kind of a breakthrough, something new against all of those enemies that are around you and simply want to erase you, you don't have any force besides the force of unity where then all the forces of nature are at your disposal working through you and uh, this way you reach equilibrium with your environment. You want to be in peace with all of your neighbors in friendship only this way. If you'll be united, like we learn from the story of Purim, then for sure you will be saved from the fear of destruction. And besides that, you'll be able to get into good relations with your neighbors. By that, you will erase anti-Semitism from the world altogether. Because all in all, the reason for anti-Semitism is that you do not set an example for the nations of the world as to how to come out of the general crisis. It's not simply so that we're reaching a state where only we feel bad. The whole world is entering this great crisis not knowing how to come out. But they're blaming the Jews. Yes, and it's true, and it's natural that that's how it is, and it'll be ever more, and it's because the solution is really upon us. If we unite, then first of all, we will chase away all, ac all accusations. We'll set an example for the world how to be united. And specifically in this global integral world that shows us the tight connection between all its parts. And then this way will be light for the nation. Okay, I have two questions here. First of all, um, regarding, regarding the nations, how is our unity a reason for them to stop hating us? What makes our unity, uh, what makes them stop hating us because we are united? How does it work? Because we have the method for correcting the world since the days of Babylon, since the days of Abraham, who was back there 4,000 years ago. There was the same thing going on, the same general crisis like is happening now around the world, only that back then the civilization was very small and everyone lived as one people. But the crisis was the same crisis as today. They felt that the ego really rules them on the one hand, that they hate each other, and that the Babylonian tower it symbolizes the great ego. On the other hand, they can't unite. The ego distances them from one another in order to keep on existing. They have to unite in the reciprocal system. So we're supposed to be an example to the world? An example uh, of so, like back then, we got from Abraham a method as to how it's possible to unite. 
to rise above the hatred. This is why it's called Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai. Sinai in Hebrew, hatred, that we can rise above that mountain. We got the method as to how to do it from Abraham. Then we got the continuity of that method during the receiving of the, when we received the Torah during the state of Mount Sinai and since then we are the owners of that method and now that we reach the state of a connected, interconnected world where on the one hand nature is closing down on all of us together but our ego is if wants to push everyone away. Yes, because, because you're saying we are the owners of the method as you put it but if I look at the Jewish people, we're not united. Right, that's the problem. That's called that we're in exile. And once again, we have to unite. Like, so we have to, we have to relearn the method? Right, right. And this is why the wisdom of Kabbalah is revealed in order to bring us this method as to how to unite. And if we will unite, then we will defeat and the win and come out in great profit and benefit will truly become the light for the whole world because today the world is in need of this method. You see that people are coming to different events, summits, uh, the G8, the G20. People don't know how to get out of the situation. It's deteriorating all the time. Yes. It doesn't sound like, like there's a victory here. It sounds more like there's a... There's mitigation. The method, the general method of correction. Yes. And when we will come to the world that will be united in a good reciprocal system and the whole world will calm down, come to tranquility. Okay, so let me just get it get it straight. When you're saying when you're talking about the Jewish people uniting as an example for the world, do you mean that by us uniting we will show them how great it is to be united? Or do you mean that we have to relearn the method by applying it to ourselves, just a sec, and then once we, we learn it, we teach it or convey it to the nations. How does it work? Both. Yeah. Both. We have to both study the method. This is why the wisdom of Kabbalah is revealing, and it reveals just one thing, how we're supposed to be correctly united between us, how to be correctly connected, and how by that, through that, we're supposed to pass this method on to the rest of the nations, and then we'll, we'll be honored instead of being disrespected and disregarded, and we will be appreciated instead of being hated. They'll start understanding why did they hate us before, because for thousands of years we did not give them the method of how to unite, a method for a new good life. And that's why it's really now the time that we have to realize it, meaning that Purim, in our times, it's truly becoming actual. And we're reaching situations where it is worthwhile for us to know in advance what does this time actually mean and how we're supposed to behave in order to make it big time, to be light for the nations, for the whole world, to get rid of anti-Semitism, bring the whole world to correction, and finally for there to be peace and tranquility in the world. And it's only up to us. It's not simply so that the nations hate us and they say that we're to blame for everything. They're right about it. They're right that we are truly to blame for that the evil is prevailing in the world because we have the method, we're the owners of the method as to how to bring the world to good. Theoretically, we are the owners of the method, but practically speaking, nobody knows about the method or nobody knows how to implement it. We know. Well, you do. Tens of thousands of people in Israel and all over the world know about this method. They listen, they understand it, and they're trying to use it. Meaning, it's not only there, it also says about Mordechai, just one in Babylon. And there were a lot of Jews there in all 127 countries. Meaning, the problem is not the land of Israel. The problem is worldwide. Anti-Semitism is not felt in Israel. But, 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 but if there are already tens of thousands of people who are aware of, the, of, of this method, and we still see that anti-Semitism is only increasing, so what is the problem here? Is, is there a critical... The problem is that we are not 
doing anything. We're, we're starting to study, we're starting to implement it, but still it's, it's only the, the beginning phase. And this is why we're turning to all the Jews all over the world. Let's start and at least acknowledge what is it that the nations demand from us? Why do they hate us? What's happening with this great crisis that suddenly we will feel that and we'll see that we're we're everyone's blaming us for for that it's happening. No one thinks that they're responsible for the crisis. I want to tell you what I meant when I said nobody knows about it. I know you do, and I know there that you have tens of thousands of students. But I've also been um, researching anti-Semitism lately, and I've heard and read. Uh, dozens of Jewish leaders uh, from all over the world, really, from the United States, from Europe, from Israel, uh, talking about the problem of anti-Semitism. They all recognize that it's, it's, it's increasing and showing up in places that it, where it never existed before, in high schools, in universities, on the street, everywhere. It's just popping up more and more, and people are getting afraid, including the leaders. The Jewish leaders don't know the method, they don't know the solution. No, because all these things were sealed for thousands of years, for actually 2,000 years since the destruction of the temple. This whole method was concealed and Jews in exile, they just kept their customs and that's it. And now we have to start uniting in practice between us with everyone this method it appeals to each and every jew it doesn't obligate him to do anything he just has to know that he must be united with the rest of the jews so they will feel that they are connected and by that they have to set an example for the world uh, they can get on our sites yes Yes, and take our books, they can t read our books, so uh, which book do you recommend? Uh, there's a self-interest uh, versus altruism that explains the whole story about Abraham and the formation of the Jewish people, and uh, there's a, a basic Kabbalah book if they want. There's a complete idiot's guide to Kabbalah, which Dr. Lightman co-authored. Um, there's Kabbalah Revealed. And there is a guide uh, to the new world, which talks about unity and the importance of it, regardless of Kabbalah. Um, there is benefits of the new economy. If you want to have a different take on an integrated economy, on a, an economy that is not capitalistic per se. In short, after our talk, we can say just one thing, that Purim is very current and we have to understand that we must operate and not just sit and wait for something to happen by acting you mean to unite as i understand it. to act means to start uniting to start uniting despite all the differences that we have we're talking in different languages where we're very far from each other we got a completely different mentality from all the nations in which we are we have to unite above all that for what? In order to, not in order to protect ourselves, that, that's for sure. It's a side effect? It's not a side effect, but the reason has to be that this is the main goal, to bring the whole world to correction. Uh -huh. So in order to bring the world to correction, we have to unite. Yes, and set an example how the whole world is supposed to be united, and then for sure, for sure, we will reach a state, like it says in Yeshayahu, that all the nations of the world will take the people of Israel on their shoulders and bring them to Israel, Jerusalem. Yes. Well, And let's hope that it will happen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's hope so. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lightman. I learned a big lesson today. I hope we all did. And uh, let's, all, let's all have a great Purim. Uh, and have a big party and think about unity. Let's, let's take this holiday really as an opportunity to unite and pass on that feeling of warmth and unity and mutual love to everyone, to the whole world. All the best and bye. Happy Purim.